All right, we'll go ahead and get going. Good morning, my name is Grace McCoy and I'm a shareholder with Anderson Zermulin and I have with me here today, Jill Galley, uh, one of my partners from our Missoula office, also a shareholder with Anderson Zermulin. And we are here today to provide you with a bit of accounting support for the school age child care uh, grants that you may have received from the state of Montana. Our objectives today is hopefully by the end of this uh, short presentation, you will understand some grant accounting basics. Uh, we'll share with you some general tips and tricks. Uh, we'll discuss general ledgers and also provide you with some accounting support for scholarships, um, tuition reimbursements. Uh, additionally, today we're going to cover some income tax considerations, whether you're a for profit or a not for profit entity, just a couple of things to consider. Before we begin today, I just want to make sure everyone is aware this presentation is not authoritative and is based on the information um, available as of today. Uh, we are here at providing you with some guidance based on our understanding of this program, the information of, available as of today. Um, Anderson Dermulin itself is not a regulator. We don't administer the grant. Um, so we're just doing our best to interpret this information and provide you with guidance. If you have specific questions regarding your grant or whether something would be allowable or not allowable, you know, please work with the granting agency. Um, they are the folks that have, who are authoritative and have um, the authority to make uh, those decisions. So before we jump into the accounting basics, uh, just a quick refresher on this program. The site does, or the state does have a site dedicated um, to these programs. I'm sure you all are very aware of that. Uh, the state has indicated that this funding should be used to provide free or reduced price childcare for school aged children uh, to fully compensate staff and to mitigate costs incurred to provide healthy, safe environments. So that's kind of the main focus of this grant, please keep that in mind through, throughout this presentation. Uh, eligible expenses. This is going to be on a case by case basis. You need to look at your specific grant contract with the state of Montana. Uh, there's also federal coronavirus relief fund FAQs, uh, Department of Health and Human Services FAQs regarding this program. Uh, those are going to guide you, uh, but please make sure you're looking at your grant document. Um, just because a, an expense is allowable for one organization doesn't mean it's allowable for all organizations. Um, some of the general allowable expenses um, that may be in your grant agreement would be payroll, supplies, equipment, rent, utilities, uh, training, fee offsets or scholarships. And so those are the ones that we're gonna focus on in our example. But again, please make sure that you're working closely with the granting agency, looking at your grant agreement for expenses that will be eligible for you. Um, the period of allowability is March, 2020 to December, 2020. But again, make sure that you're looking at your grant agreement for your specific period of availability. So, Jumping right into some grant accounting basics. We're gonna start off with some just general tips and tricks. And some of these are gonna be refreshers from information that's probably already been provided to you, but really important to understand, no double dipping. This includes funds received through the PPP loan program, through the business stabilization program, through any other federal or state program that you've received funding, if, you have an allowable expense, for example, payroll that you've charged to the payroll protection or the PPP loan program, you cannot utilize those same salaries and benefits as allowable expenses under this program. So it's gonna be very, very important that you understand that and you're using separate expenses for each and every program. Uh, documentation is key. It's gonna be important to retain all of your receipts. While you're not required to provide all of those receipts upon submitting your report, uh, the state of Montana could certainly come in as part of their subrecipient monitoring and ask you to provide those receipts. So very important that you retain all of those receipts. Uh, very important to document key decisions. 
Um, if you do decide to, uh, you know, issue hazard pay or um, you are going to uh, make some changes to your space to make it more safe for the COVID environment, you're going to want to make sure you document the decisions you make and why you made those. That will be very important. Also document inquiries and responses with the granting authority. If you do have a specific question, um, I, I know the granting authorities are, are quite busy right now, and so you may not be able to get a response, but if you have a specific question, you know, um, and you do get a response from them, make sure that you re retain that documentation um, in your file. Prepaid expenses are not allowable. For example, if you pay January rent on December 30th, that is not an allowable expenditure. You will be required to return those funds. Uh, if you have um, a cell phone that you could prepay for a whole year, again, you're not going to want to, you, you cannot prepay your cell phone for a whole year, um, even if the expense, you know, such as rent or utilities would be allowable you cannot prepay those expenses. So something very important to keep in mind that expenses um, need to be incurred um, related to a, a period that's already happened prior to December 30th. Uh, all pay included, ha ha including hazard pay should be run through payroll. Um, this is just a general federal guideline. There, there is a, a very small de minimis um, amount, but especially with this grant, we would highly suggest that all hazard pay bonuses run through payroll. Um, there are some accounting considerations that you should be working with your, your payroll um, provider with on that. Um, but in general, it, it's really important that you run that through payroll. Also monitor our uh, reporting requirements and deadlines. Uh, most of you have already hopefully filed your interim, interim report. Final reports, I believe, are due in January. Make sure that you're closely monitoring these deadlines um, to avoid, again, any uh, potential scenarios where you may have to return funding or may be <clears throat> uh, on the naughty list for future grants or future funds. So now I'm going to jump into general ledgers. Uh, as many of you know, these general ledgers are going to be required for grant funds in excess of 50K. Very important to note this is across all programs administered by the state of Montana. So if you received $10,000 via the business stabilization grant and $40,000 through the school aged um, school age children child care program, then you would be required to provide the general ledger detail for, for both of those programs. So many of you might be asking, what is a general ledger? Uh, per the Department of Health and Human Services, a general ledger report contains all account summaries, including details of every transaction going in and out of accounts. It should be organized by the date and account or funding type. So we would recommend in this case that ensure that you have separate grant accounts to track your revenue and expenses. This could also be done via class in QuickBooks, but at a minimum, uh, at a very minimum, you could track it by class, but we would highly recommend that you have separate grant accounts to track both the revenue and expenses associated with the grant. Um, and so I'm going to pull open uh, an example ledger here that um, I created, and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger here so you folks can see. Um, Okay, so this is a general ledger that um, I created. I ran out of QuickBooks, created some transactions in QuickBooks. And so um, obviously your organization name, some of you may be familiar with this report. This comes directly out of QuickBooks Online. Um, your organization would be up here. It's called the general ledger report. It's found under for your accountant in the report. And then you're gonna wanna run it. You're gonna wanna make sure you run it for the date of the, the grant, the period of allowability. 
and you're going to want to include all of your grant accounts. So you have your revenue account and here's where the deposit came in from the state of Montana. In this case, in my example, $70,000 was received. And then I have expenses that are um, personnel related. And I would highly suggest that you include the detail, the date that they were paid, the payroll check number, the uh, payee's name, and then a, a memo here, you know, the memo just says gross pay, but you could put payroll, um, the payroll dates in this column. Bethany, were you going to say something? Oh. Okay, and, and then, you know, the, the payroll amounts here. And then um, we have the expenses for non-personnel related. And this has to do, what, what I would recommend is on the actual grant reports, these are the categories they ask for. So supplies, equipment, rent, utilities, training, and scholarships. And they have an other category. And if you do have other costs, it, it has you specifically put those um, on the grant report. So I would set up expense accounts for each of these. And again, you're going to have the date that they were purchased, the vendor. You know, I use the examples of Amazon, Target, Rosars, and then a description of, of what you bought there. So cleaning supplies, hand sanitizers, math workbooks, breakfast snacks, et cetera, and then the amount. And so again, the state wants to see the date, the vendor, a description of the expense, and then of course the cost. And of you know, I have some utilities, some training, and then down here is the scholarships. And this is where I'm going to go ahead and hand things off to my partner here, Jill. I'm gonna get the presentation back up. And she's going to talk about specifically accounting for um, scholarships, tuition, offsets, refunds, et cetera. Thanks so much, Grace. So as Grace mentioned, the intent of this program really was to provide, you know, access to care at a reduced rate where possible. Um, oftentimes, there's been a little bit of misconception on what is considered lost revenue versus these discounts or scholarships that have been um, that have been put forth to your program participants. So for you know our conversation, let's just really focus in on scholarships, scholarships, discounts, however it is that you provided that reduced rate to your um, program participants. So what we have here is this is first example, example one, this is the ideal scenario. So this is how it would have been recorded had you known all of, you know, everything that you've learned thus far in administering this program um, from, from the get-go. These transactions should be used as kind of a framework because the, uh, the mechanics of how you get this into your own accounting system may differ slightly depending on what system you're using. But in general, what you want to be able to show and demonstrate is the tuition that you would have charged your normal rate. So irregardless of any scholarship or discount, you want to record that at the grossed up amount. Then you are going to record uh, your scholarship, i.e. the amount that's being reimbursed by the grant program or um, by the grant, and then the cash being paid in by the participant. So at the end of the day, you'll have you know, your total income less expenses. In this case, the scholarship uh, is being treated as an expense or a contra revenue account. So offsetting that tuition income and you will be demonstrating $2,000 of cash received, 1,000 from a parent and 1,000 from the grant in the form of a reimbursement. 
Um, I should also say, feel free to drop any questions that you might have in the chat box. Um, if there are questions as we go through this, um, we do have someone monitoring that chat box and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, with that caveat, you know, if it's questions on how you get this into your specific accounting software, you probably want to take it offline and circle back um, with, every, you know, with someone one on one. There's just too many variables to go into that uh, for us to give you a, a good answer without, you know, diving into your system. So I said this was kind of the ideal. Uh, our next example, next two examples are kind of what you would do if you were, were to, if you need to go back and record this um, after the fact, as many of you may be doing. So potentially offering refunds to your program participants who have paid their full tuition, but given the grant, you're now able to give them a discount through a refund. In this case, you will um, record the scholarship again as a contra revenue or expense account, and then the cash actually leaving your organization as a credit. In example three here, this is if your scholarships were not previously recorded. You want to make sure that you capture that information as Grace demonstrated in that general ledger. It's important to be able to show how each and every dollar of this uh, grant was spent via that general ledger. So making sure that you record the scholarships or discounts provided to your program participants is important as that is, that is a, an expense, if you will, that's being incurred. So here we have our total monthly child care cost of $2,000, total monthly child care scholarship covered by the grant of 1,000, sticking with our same, pro, or our same uh, math here. You're going to go ahead and record the scholarship again as a debit, and then the credit or offset will be to your tuition income. Can forward to the next slide, please. Okay, so the other thing we wanna mention, income tax consideration. So, um, a little misconception, some of you may be working in a nonprofit arena. There are still income tax considerations to, um, to consider. Regardless of whether you are a for-profit entity, uh, an individual, maybe, you know, maybe the um, transactions that we're talking here are going to flow through to your personal 1040, Form 1040, or a nonprofit who's filing a 990, um, and the version of that 990 may vary this year depending on uh, the level of funding that you have received. So per Montana.gov, financial assistance being funded through the CARES Act, the receipt of a government grant by a business is generally not excluded from the business's gross income under tax code and is therefore taxable. So very important to Im information to remember as a for-profit entity, this, these proceeds are in fact included in your gross income subject to income taxes. If you are a nonprofit entity, there are some other considerations to uh, keep in mind. Depending on your level of gross annual gross receipts being received during the year, you know, you may have historically filed either the 990N or 990EZ. Both of these forms are, you know, fairly straightforward and simple enough to prepare, particularly if you're used to preparing those year over year. However, uh, depending on how much funding you have received during the year, you may have been bumped up above the threshold that allows you to file those more simplified forms. So if you find yourself in that situation, you will need to file the full 990 form. Now, this form um, is much, much more voluminous than the other two forms. And there's a bit more, um, well, not a bit more, there's a lot more information that the government will be requesting through that form. Other consideration to keep in mind these forms are all subject to public disclosure. So if you, know, you are uh, an organization that is receiving charitable contributions or 
um, potentially, you know, grants from other private foundations and things of that nature. You want to make sure that the information you're putting out to the public shines, you know, the best and brightest light on your organization. So making sure that this form is, is complete and accurate is very important. Um, you know, I, you, you may have the expertise on staff to complete that form for your organization, but if not, please do seek out, you know, external assistance. All right, so your next steps, where do you go from here? Make sure you have those grant agreements out in front of you um, at all times. Know them you know, backwards and forwards. Be very familiar with how the language in those agreements reads. That will be your, you know, your best friend in determining appropriate accounting treatment. Determine your accounting needs and apply your knowledge. The knowledge may be from this presentation and, and others you may have attended and reach out for help if needed. So reach out to your granting agency, reach out to, um, reach out to us. <laughs> if, if you have uh, questions that you feel like we can answer, we are more than happy to help with those. Um, you know, we can, if it's a, a quick question or something that you feel like you just need to bounce an idea off of somebody, we're happy to answer those. Um, if, you know, if we do need to dig in and do some more in-depth research for you, um, we can do that as well. So please don't feel uh, worried or hesitate to reach out for help. Your granting agency, as Grace noted, is a great place to start for questions on allowability. Um, and then from an accounting perspective, we're happy to help with those. And we're happy to share with you, you know, that the experience that we have in um, working with organizations who have administered similar programs in the past. Not that, uh, not that the past necessarily dictates the world we're living in right now, but we, we can do our best to apply that knowledge. So at this time, we can either um, you know, open the chat up if any questions have come in through the chat or question, question and answers or we're happy to take them, you know, if you're comfortable unmuting your line, uh, we're happy to field those questions now. Um, again, you know, there may be some instances that we need to recommend we take offline and, and dive into on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but uh, we can do our best to answer as many as we can. And I think um, there was only one question so far in the chat and Grace was able to answer it there. Oh, perfect, okay. So yeah, but I know you guys have some questions. So either put them in the chat or let us know what your questions are. Well, in case anyone's fast and furious typing away in the chat, we'll give everyone a minute to, to hit enter on that. Um, contact information for Grace and I, um, can be found at the end of this presentation, also on our website, which is az, apple and zebra, world.com. Um, and again, please feel free to reach out to us if a question comes up later on as you're talking, talking things through at your, with your, each of your organizations. Michelle has a question. What about typing up a scholarship letter and having the parents sign them? I'm not sure, is that? You know, documentation of the scholarships that have been provided is certainly a, a good practice to get in the habit of, um, of doing. It wouldn't necessarily change the accounting treatment, but documenting who received those uh, scholarships is certainly a best practice. And I want to hear more about how we can use gift cards with this grant money and where that falls within the accounting aspect. I can um, say we are going to put on our frequently asked questions some different ideas around what you can use the gift cards for. The biggest caveat is they cannot be spent. They have to have some sort of stopgap that they can't be spent on either um, alcohol or tobacco. And as to the accounting aspects, I will let Jill and Grace take that. Yeah, um, you know, it would probably depend. I, I'm, I guess 
not having known historically what conversations have been had surrounding gift cards, um, you know, they would just be treated as, as an expense uh, like any other purchase. There are some considerations if those gift cards are being provided to employees. Um, the IRS has set a de minimis threshold, but they may be considered wages. So you wanna take that into account if that is your intention on using them. Um, you know, the state has also provided some pretty uh, clear language that prepaid expenses are not allowable under this program. So if, you know, if you're intending to, you know, go buy $200 worth of gift cards for Costco so that you can stock up on hand sanitizer in 2021, that, you know, I personally would not recommend that. That's just my personal opinion. Um, so again, not having been part of the historical conversations, I'm not sure if that's anywhere close to where, where the question's coming from, but. Yeah, this is, I think I saw on your FAQs, Stephanie, this was something that you guys had addressed and I had the same concerns as Jill had. Um, it sounds like maybe you've worked that out with the state though. So um, I, I'm not sure, but I, I, you know, certainly wouldn't recommend that. Um, yeah, that I know it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a fuzzy area and we can seek out more clarification. That was guidance that we got from the state was that gift cards were an allowable expense so long as they were not used for tobacco or alcohol. But I can certainly seek out further guidance and make sure um, that we're on the right track. Yeah, I would just remember the focus of this program is to pr provide free or reduced child care and to pay your staff and to cover any expenses kind of above and beyond what your original expenses would be given the pandemic. Um, that's where I would focus my attention. If I was reporting costs, I would really um, focus, focus around that. Um, so let's see here. Our question is around payroll. Our elementary age children are incorporated in our younger children. We are wondering what best practices would be for documenting payroll when we're considering using the percentage of elementary. Yes, okay. So what do you think is a good and acceptable method? Do you have any ideas? Um, I would likely allocate it on number of children unless you think, um, you know, below school age ch children require additional care or more of your staff time. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you had five children that were under the school aged and 10 that were over, I'd allocate if, if there was, you know, one provider caring for both at the same time, I would allocate that, you know, one third to the uh, children under the school aged and two thirds to this program, um, that would be a way to do it. But more than anything, I would just document, 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 whatever you decide, write it down, apply it consistently. Um, and that would be kind of my, my main suggestion. Um, there's a couple of probably different ways you can do it, um, but you know your program's best, you know how much of your staff time is likely going towards those younger kids as opposed to um, your older kids, but just make sure you put together a policy, you document that policy, and then you apply it consistently. Agree, Grace, absolutely. See, if most of our school age mm -hmm. kids were already on scholarship, can we give Karen's parents gift cards as appreciation or pay it forward to our parents, even if they don't have to pay for childcare? Um, I have not seen any specific guidance that speaks to this. I'm assuming that maybe the scholarships you're referring to are a best beginning, um, something of that nature. If it's, if it's a scholarship that you yourself are providing as an organization, um, that, that may be an allowable expense if your, your attendees or your students are receiving it from another state, federal, any other sort of outside agency, I would say that it, that would be consider that double dip that, you know, people are being cautioned heavily against. Um, 
giving the parents gift cards as appreciation, that's pretty gray. Uh, again, my personal opinion, I would not recommend it, um, but work with your state agency and your granting agency uh, you know, if you have those specific questions. I wouldn't recommend it though. I almost wonder if that one there's, um, you cannot subgrant any of the funds and we've had questions around that. If we have um, mm -hmm. kids coming in from a separate organization, can we make a donation to them? And the answer is no. So I, I kind of feel like that might be similar. Like you're saying, if, if it's a scholarship you're already giving, then you can refund that money. But um, yeah, I don't think if your program, I don't think you can just give parents money out of this funding. That's not what it's intended for. Agree. Um, what about items that are received yeah. after the first of the year and have been on back order for months? Yeah, I would, I mean, if you are, I'm assuming if these are necessary expenses, you've gone ahead and made another purchase elsewhere, I would put the, the expense for the funds or the supplies, let's say you've already received toward the grant first. Um, yeah, that, that's a struggle. I know shipping has been a real issue, you know, across the board for all kinds of uh, reasons. So possibly it's allowable that assuming the supplies or goods that you are ordering are considered allowable. I would, again, I would check with the granting agency. Um, but again, I am assuming that you probably had to go and replace those already. So that, that's where I would put my focus is the goods and supplies that you've received prior to December 30. And do paychecks have Grace. to be classed under, oh, did you want to check with Grace on that? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we do have a little bit of a lag. I don't know if you guys have noticed <laughs> between the three of us. So, um, okay. So the other question, do paychecks have to be classed under the grant individually or can you move the journal entry? You could certainly do it via journal entry. I would just ensure that you're including enough information in that journal entry in the memo line so that the granting agency understands what's in there. Um, but absolutely, you can go ahead and move it via journal entry. I would just maybe reference a pay period and maybe the folks that were um, paid in that pay period any other information like that that might be relevant. Is it okay to apply administrative support staff payroll to grants to this grant for their indirect work running the programs? The executive director, operations, finance director, et cetera, or should we just use the percent method? Yeah, that's an op an option uh, or a, really a decision that should be made at the organization level. Um, the short answer is yes, you can apply administrative support staff, assuming that those individuals impacted or were impacted by this program, worked on this program. Um, so there's a, a few ways you can do that. I'm assuming that that percentage method you're referring to as a, a de minimis indirect cost method that's allowed. Um, you could certainly utilize that. You could also, you know, if you have folks keeping good time records, you can use the time records to allocate their time uh, to this program. So it, it really just depends on, on your specific organization and, you know, the level of uh, record keeping that has been historically held. You know, if those records don't exist, it's going to be probably a little challenging to go back and recreate them. Um, if we invited some kids to see a show without paying, uh, giving them comp tickets, can we count those kids as participants in our program, even though no money changes hands towards us or towards them? 
I'm I think gonna say a little bit more information on the program. Yeah. Like, like is are you providing childcare for the show or are they coming with parents or um I don't know if you wanna unmute and maybe give us a little bit more background. Naomi, did, do you want to speak to that or do you want um, to connect with one of us offline? Yeah, feel free to connect with us offline. I think we need a little bit more um, information or, around that one. Okay. Oh, it's, it's okay. For. Um, so yeah, these are kids that have been invited to the program that, um, so it's a, a theater program, and so they are able to come and attend for free um, from a, yeah, they're able to come and attend for free. And they aren't yeah. under any supervision, like the Watson staff isn't coming with them. Let's connect. Let's connect about this one offline. Um, Naomi, I'm happy to. I'm happy to connect with you um, about this one um, after the call. Just feel free to reach out to myself, you know, and or Bethany, and we'll we can talk about this one. Um, awesome. So uh, I have temporary employees, and the pay period ends after the new year. Am I allowed to charge the grant for that pay period? So you would be allowed to charge the grant for the pay for the dates up to 12 30 2020 so if your employee worked five days prior to 12 30 2020 that would be allowable i believe the expense has to be paid by bethany is it january 15th yep okay January 15th, but yep, you would, you might have to do some allocation. So al allocating a portion of it based on the days worked prior to 12, 30, 2020, but um, absolutely for, for those days, you could allocate a portion, even if it's paid after year end. Other questions? We have probably time for just a handful more and then we'll let you folks kind of get on with your day. And again, if you have specific questions um, or need help, you know, putting together a GL or setting, you know, setting it up so you can, you know, classify certain expenses, um, please feel free to reach out. Funny, this normally isn't such a quiet group, I don't think. <laughs> Is it true for contracted accounting services as well? Their work for the month of December is paid on January 5th. Can I count that towards the grant? Um, assuming that um, the accounting services were in direct response to the grant, yes. Yes, this would be for any expenses where the expense was actually incurred prior to 12, 30, 2020 and paid by, I think it's the deadline is January 15th. Those are um, allowable. I, I know, um, and Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to mention, um, you know, I know you're going to be posting um, a copy of the presentation and the recording. Um, just wanted to make sure everyone knew that because I'm not sure I ever answered that question. Um, David, the examples. 
Oh, like um, the examples, the sample general ledger that Grace showed, is that your question, David? Okay, Grace, is that something that you can send me and we can put up on our page as well? Or how do you wanna sure, do that? Sure, I think so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, this was generated out of QuickBooks online. And as Jill noted, each accounting system will be a little bit different, but I think this would probably give folks just a general idea of what I believe. Again, this is my interpretation of what the state um, is looking for. Yeah, and I think Katie had a similar question are you required to use a general ledger format that we showed? No, um, that is just an example of one format that does come out of QuickBooks. Um, can we simply pull a general ledger report from our grant class in QuickBooks? That should be fine. As long as it includes the details that the state has requested, the format may look very different or slightly different from the one that was shown on screen. Mm -hmm. Um, Tracy, just seeing your question here. Let's see, we could not book tuition via scholarship since the grant funds were used to run the program and basically replaced the tuition funds uh, we normally would have collected. Um, we may, again, this is when we may need to touch base after the fact to make sure that I have, you know, all of the facts surrounding your specific situation. Um, because there, there must Jill, be a piece of that puzzle to, that I'm missing. Oh, yeah, I did okay. ask her to just reach out to us after the call. Wonderful. And Kayla, your question, I don't think there's a right format that the state is requesting. You know, as long as the detail is in there, I believe that they will be willing to work with the um, whatever format your system provides. And the grant, so in the interim report, um, they did not accept Excel files as an uploadable document. There's a bunch of different documents that you can use, um, but you can uh, save an Excel document as a CSV file and that you can upload. Or you could print it to PDF um, is another option. I would assume they allow PDFs to be uploaded. Um, usually in, in QuickBooks Online, um, you can either print to Excel or, or I'm, I'm sorry, export to Excel or print to PDF. If the state decides our general ledgers are lacking, I am assume they'll just ask for further detail. Uh, I am not, I'm not sure how the state would handle this. Um, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, recommend providing less detail and hope that they follow up with you. Uh, I don't think you ever want to be on the list that they're following up with. Um, I mean, not that anybody has anything to hide, but, um, you know, again, it'll be part of the subrecipient monitoring process. And I, I don't know that, um, you know, one request could turn into multiple requests, could turn into reviewing all your documentation. And I know all of you kept all your receipts and that's not gonna be a problem, but just you know, sheerly uploading them and, and providing that detail could, could be timely. And so um, I, I, that might be what this, they, the state does. They might just ask for um, a general ledger with more detail, but I would um, highly recommend including the components that they had requested, which is the date, the amount, the vendor, and a description of the expense. All right. Well, you folks have our contact information. Um, we sure do appreciate your time and um, really, really, truly appreciate the amazing work that all of you are doing to, you know, provide this much needed service to our communities across Montana um, during this totally unprecedented time. So um, if there's anything that we can do to help you make the administrative piece easier, you know, please feel free to reach out with um, questions. Um, et cetera. And I hope everyone has a wonderful uh, holiday season. Yeah. And Thanks I just, everyone. 
I want to thank Jill and Grace so much for stepping up into this arena. As I've told uh, most of you in our previous webinars, this is not my area of expertise. And I feel like probably Jill and Grace can speak to that even from the questions that I've been asking them. So I'm really great that you, grateful that you guys are here um, and, and offering this help to everybody. I did put in the chat box our uh, webpage that has recordings of the previous webinars that we answered about the child care grants. And then that's also where we will put the recording of this uh, webinar and any other information that we can get out there. All of our FAQs are there. DPHHS's FAQs around the grants are there. The federal FAQs around the, the coronavirus relief funds are all there. Um, so please don't hesitate to jump on that website and read all of the great stuff that's there and reach out to any of us, any of the three of us, if you have any questions. So thanks so much, everybody. We'll uh, see you again soon.